want to start by saying thank you. Um, there is no way I was excited about preaching last week's sermon. Um, for those of you who are here, you will know that it's just one of those passages that you really prefer to pretend is not there. And um, Anne and I have received absolutely nothing but love and support from people in this church. And uh, thank you. We really, really appreciate that. Um, there are a couple of other items that we need to take care of. Two weeks ago, I created work for Kathy Silvertooth, who is just now sitting down. Um, thanks for joining us this morning, Kathy. Um, I made a promise. I said, if you will rewrite all of Romans in your own words, Kathy will do something for you. Well, in talking over with the staff, they thought, hey, that was a good idea. Um, let's not just limit it to like the youth. Let's include the entire church. So anyone in the church, Kathy will do something for you. <laughs> Here is what she's going to do. She's going to show up at our house. What we want to do is we want to invite anyone who writes the book of Romans out in their own words to come to our house after the series is over, and we're just going to celebrate with food that's not good for you. Um, mainly ice cream, but I'm sure we'll have other things in there as well. And we just want to spend some time together, uh, and we would love to do that. Now, it has been suggested that we have a place online that people can post as they're rewriting it. And um, I believe that now exists. Is that right? On the Facebook page? Adam? Post in the Facebook group. Okay, yes. If you have questions about that, write it on your care card and we'll get you the information or just call Adam at home at night. Um, <laughs> someone raised a really good question. Is it okay to rewrite these passages in your own word? Are we kind of playing with God's word when we do that? That's a great, great question. Um, and the answer to that is to remember that even what we have is a translation of Scripture. Um, and then you have, for example, um, things like the Living Bible, which was my first Bible, very important to me. And what the Living Bible was, was a guy by the name of Ken Taylor actually just sitting down and saying, let me take an English translation and put it into words that make sense to me, that I understand, and that a kid could understand. And that's what he did. And that's kind of what I'm asking you to do. So what's important is that you actually stick with the meaning. Um, you don't want to change the meaning when you do that. For example, in today's passage that Taylor uh, read for us, you've got something like hard heart. Now, that's not terminology that I normally use. I would say something like they, are, they don't care what God thinks, and they're just really comfortable with that. Um, you've got the word Impenitent. That's a word I never use. It just means that they don't repent. So what I wouldn't do is I wouldn't change it to it means they get angry a lot. Because that's not what the word impenitent means. But I would use, I'd use what's the word or what's the way that I say that. And that's, that's actually what Bible translators do. Um, and, and I really think that's okay. Just work hard not to change the meaning. And you will find, that here's the big reason to do this, it slows you down. When you have to really think through it, it will slow you down, and you will start seeing Scripture in a completely different way. And I've even received feedback from people who are already started that, just because they've had to slow down. It's like this Scripture comes alive. So that's, what, that's why we're doing this, and that's what I hope will happen. And if you will actually do all 16 chapters of Romans... Uh, Kathy will greet you at the door as you come over to our house, and we will serve you lots of ice cream. That, is, of course, is assuming that Kathy has rewritten the passage. <laughs> um, 
we are in week three of our series in Romans. We're calling the series in Romans, Live by Faith. That's because that's really kind of the key idea in Romans is, is those who are righteous live by faith. And that is very central. Now, for us to understand Romans, we need to keep coming back to what is the context? What has been going on behind the scenes in the book of Romans? And what we've talked about, if you've been here, is that Romans was the church or churches, because there are probably multiple churches in Rome, were probably started um, right around A.D. 33, 34, somewhere in there, by Jews who had come to Christ in Jerusalem when they were there for Pentecost. So they come to Christ, they go back home to Rome, and it specifically says in Acts that there were Jews at Pentecost from Rome. And they go back to Rome and they start the church. And over time, Gentiles come to Christ and join that church. And then in AD 49, the emperor of Rome says to all the Jews in Rome, you guys are creating problems out. Every Jew in Rome has to leave, including those Jewish Christians who started the church. And about seven, eight years later, They are allowed to come back into Rome, and they start coming back. And it's shortly after that that Paul writes the book of Romans. And these are the people that he has never met, at least not up to this point. Um, But think about what that must have been like for someone who had been the leader of the church, a founder of the church, to be gone and then come back and see that the church is now being led by people with a very different cultural background, right? There are certain things that were very important to people with a Jewish background and what it meant to relate to God that that Gentiles may or may not keep going after the Jews are gone. And in fact, there's reason to think as you go through Romans that those things stopped happening. Um, And you think about the, the stress and pressure that that would create. And so that's the background as Paul writes Romans And in the very first section of Romans, in the introduction, we have these two verses, verses 16 and 17 of chapter 1, which kind of set the whole theme for the entire book as Paul addresses people in this situation. And the heart of his response is the gospel. And that's what he is going to do, is he's going to take them back. These are believers, but he's writing to believers and says, I want to take you back to the gospel, and we need to really understand the gospel, and we need to understand what is the connection between the gospel and the righteousness of God. Because when you understand that, when you get that, all the other things are going to start to take care of themselves. The book of Romans, as we've seen, is really divided into two sections. Chapters 1 through 11 talks about how righteousness comes from God. God is the source of righteousness. He's the standard of righteousness. And then once righteousness has been given, the rest of the book deals with how the righteous must live, and they must live by faith. We are this morning in this first section. Why do we need righteousness? Why is it important? This is a kind of four-part section. So we're looking at this in four sermons. And here's the bad news, guys. These are all kind of bummer passages. So you've got things like we saw last week, that God's wrath is just for everyone, even those without the law. And then this week, we're going to see that God's wrath is just in its final execution. And that justice and that final execution is coming. And it applies to everybody. And then we're going to specifically talk about those with the law. And then you have this kind of capstone on this section where no one is righteous on their own efforts. In last week's section, you might remember this chart. This is a very helpful chart to think about what is the nature of sin? What makes sin, sin? And what Paul said last time is that what makes sin, sin is at its core, it's idolatry. You are taking something from creation and you are putting it in the place of the creator. You are taking something from creation and saying, this is what gives me life. This is what will take care of me. This is what gives my life meaning. And you're asking it to carry a weight that only the creator can carry. And the most common piece of creation that we put there 
in the place of idolatry is ourselves. Once we do that, Paul argued last week, it affects what we want. It affects how our emotions operate. It affects how we think. And that distortion of those things eventually becomes evident in things that are visible. And if you remember, Paul gave a list of 22 different behaviors, attitudes, or character traits last week that were the visible manifestations of idolatry that was at work underneath. And Paul's whole point in giving that list was that absolutely everyone is guilty. Everyone, there is no one that has a basis for self-righteousness. There is no one that has a basis for saying, look what I have accomplished. Everyone, everyone is guilty. And that takes us to the do not enter problem. What is the first thing that people do when they see a sign that says do not enter? Especially if it's like on a section of grass in a yard or lawn or something, what's the first thing that they do? The first thing they do is they go, huh, that's interesting. I wonder who that applies to. And then they go right in. It's the do not enter problem. It's the that sign applies to everyone. Except for me. And that is what Paul is going to address in today's passage. You see, one way to respond to the idea that everyone is guilty is to assume that everyone means everyone else. Or it might mean, so what if I'm guilty? God doesn't really care. These are the mindsets, the attitudes that Paul is going to address today. You've got a group of people who misunderstand who God is and what he's up to, and they make the assumption that God does not care about their unrighteousness. Outwardly, you're going to see that they look incredibly spiritual. They look very spiritually busy doing very good spiritual things, but in reality, they are spiritually apathetic. I am concerned that our churches today are filled with people just like that. And I am concerned that even in my own life, I have been that person. And Paul is going to address this hidden apathy by showing that judgment is coming, the judge is impartial, and the judge applies the same standard to absolutely everyone. In verses 1 through 5, he introduces us to the idea that judgment is coming. Now, he does something really fascinating in these verses. You see this, oh man. What Paul is doing, and this is just kind of a teaching device or a reasoning device, he is introducing an imaginary friend. And here's how this works. Paul is going to have a debate with this imaginary friend, and we are going to hear one side of it. Now, we'll find out later, actually, it specifically tells us in verse 17 that this imaginary person, this imaginary debater is someone who's Jewish, who represents the Jewish perspective. But we're going to see hints of that all the way along, and especially in like verse 12. Now, what do we know about this imaginary person from verse 1? The first thing we know is that he passes judgment on others. And the basis, it seems, for what he does that is the list that we just looked at in Romans 1. In other words, he's going through that list and doing everything that we said you should not do last week. Goes to that list and said, look, that person's guilty of that. Aren't they a bad person? Look, that person's guilty of that. They are unrighteous. They are condemned by God. And Paul is saying, guess what? You do that and you condemn yourself because you practice the very same things. Paul's just kind of reiterating the point that we made last week. Every single person is guilty. So who are you, imaginary friend, to stand and judge these people as condemned when you do the very same things? It's the do not enter problem. You would think that Paul wouldn't have to make the point. He just said it a couple verses ago. But he makes the point 
precisely because of the do not enter problem. This person, this imaginary friend, doesn't believe that God's judgment actually applies to him. And we start seeing that unfold in the next few verses. This person supposes that he will escape judgment of God. Why does he think this? Verse 4 answers the question. He presumes on the riches of God's kindness and forbearance and patience. Do you get the picture of what's happening here? This person, let's say, is guilty of greed. He's pointing out everyone else's flaws, saying how they're condemned, but he himself is guilty of greed. But what is he actually experiencing in his daily life? In his daily life, things seem to be going fine. In his daily life, he might even be successful in building up his wealth. And he is concluding, it's like, well, I know greed's on the list, and I know I'm kind of guilty of that, but it's obviously not a big deal. God's not doing anything with it. It's not on the priority list. There's nothing happening that's making him miserable, so he figures God just doesn't care. And what Paul's friend here has done is he has drawn the wrong conclusion about what God is doing. Because, in fact, the judgment of God is coming. And the reason, the reason that God has been kind and forbearing and patient was to lead the person to repentance. So what he's saying is, God is not crushing you, not because he's okay with your greed, but because he is waiting for you to repent from it. And so God is being kind to you. He is tolerating your, your behavior and your attitudes and your, your character in this area. He's, he, he is being patient, waiting for you to come before him and say, this is wrong, I want to change. And that is why God is being patient. It's not that God doesn't care. God's kindness should lead us to be overwhelmed by his love and grace and mercy so much and so deep that we say, this is someone I want to please and this is someone I want to be like. And that is how it leads us to repentance. But that's not what they're doing. They are not repenting. In fact, it says that their heart is hard. And as I said earlier, that basically means they're kind of settled into the fact that they don't care what God thinks and what God wants. They have an impenitent heart. That means repentance is nowhere on the radar. They have no intention and they're making no effort to change whatsoever. And so Paul says the result is that you are storing up wrath for yourself. That's just a way of saying that their ongoing righteousness is going to be dealt with when judgment comes. And the more ongoing righteousness you keep piling up, the more there is to deal with. And when that judgment comes, it's going to be clear that the judgment was righteous. That means no one, not even Paul's imaginary friend, are going to be able to say, God was unfair. When you come face to face with the righteous God, with the holy God, and you see who he is and what he's like, and you realize the depth of those things that are on the list, the seriousness of those things that are on the list, that they must be dealt with. And Paul is saying, God is being patient so that you will deal with them now before the coming judgment when it will all be dealt with. If we think that God is apathetic about righteousness, we are going to be apathetic about righteousness. And so we go to a passage like last week's and we acknowledge that, that our gossip and our pride and our condescending attitudes are on the same list as things like haters of God and inventors of evil. But we're not experiencing any consequences of those things, so we think God must not think it's a big deal. How many times in my own life, and I will not answer this question, I'll let you answer the question for yourself. How many times in my own life 
have I gone before the Lord with a quick, I'm sorry about that, God. But there was no intention, no real desire to change and become more like Christ in that area. And Paul is warning, don't confuse God's patience with God's apathy. If last week we said the point was to own your mess, this week the point is deal with your mess. Everyone will be held accountable. Now, there is a reason that Paul's imaginary friend thought God was being kind and forbearing and patient. He thought there's a very logical reason that God would treat him that way. He thought that he was outside of God's judgment for the same reason that people all over East Texas think they are outside of God's judgment. They think that God just likes them better. What Paul is going to show in verses 6 through 11 is that God is an impartial judge. He will render to each one according to his works. You see, Paul's whole point in these verses is that God shows no partiality. That would not be a controversial statement to Paul's imaginary friend. Paul is saying that he renders, he judges according to each person's works. That would not have been a controversial statement to Paul's imaginary friend. But here's what would be a controversial statement. The Jew first and also the Greek. The Jew first and also the Greek again. You see, the thinking at that time for someone with a Jewish background was what made you right before God was that you were part of the Jewish community. And so he would look at a passage like this. He would look at these verses and say, absolutely, there's going to be tribulation and distress for everyone who does evil. That would be the Greeks. Greek was another way of saying Gentile. Anyone outside of the Jewish community. And Paul's debater would say, absolutely, there's going to be glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good. That would be the Jew. This does not apply to the Greeks. That does not apply to the Jews. So God doesn't show partiality. If you're a Jew, the Jews are a part of God's people. Of course they're going to be blessed. God judges everyone by their works. If you're a Gentile, there'll be glory and honor and peace for the Jews, but not for the Greeks. The Jews are a part of God's people. The Gentiles are on the outside. So if you want to think about what does Paul's debater's perspective on this look like, it looks like this. You start with asking a question. Are you a part of God's people? Are you Jewish? If the answer to that is yes, you are righteous. You have things that are designed to keep you and mark you out as someone who's a part of the Jewish community. You have the law. You have rituals like, like what you do with dietary foods and, and how you clean and, and you have to keep the Sabbath and things like that. These are very important. You do these things that marks you off as being a part of God's people. You are declared righteous because you're a part of God's people. Are you Jew? If you're not Jewish, you are unclean and your future is wrath. You're Jewish, you're righteous, your future is blessing. That was their perspective. That is the perspective of a lot of people in churches today. We just have a Christian version of it. Are you a part of Christian culture? Yes. Well, then that's how I know you're righteous and you're going to be blessed. How do I know you're a part of Christian culture? Because you, write the, you, you watch the right TV shows, you listen to the right music, you see the right movies, you avoid the wrong ones. You vote for the right politicians and not the wrong ones. 
You go to church on a regular basis. You're always at youth group. You're serving. You're fully engaged in Christian culture. But heaven forbid that you watch the wrong media, have the wrong behavior, do something that that's not the Christian thing to do, and you are worldly. And people start wondering if your destination is wrath. Here's the question for you. What is more important to you? Is it more important to you to appear righteous or to be righteous? This passage takes you right to the heart of questions like, why are you here this morning? Why do you go to youth group? Why do you read your Bible in public? Why do you participate up here on stage on Sunday morning? Why do you do service projects? Are these your rituals to appear righteous to people so you can be accepted in the Christian culture and everyone will think, wow, that person is righteous? Or are you trying to pursue God? Verses 7 and 8 continue the challenge. You see, who God is judging has nothing to do with, with, with which socioeconomic or ethnic group you're a part of. It has nothing to do with that type of group. This is not about judging Jew versus Gentile. He is judging everyone based on their hearts. And there are two groups. There are those who seek for what is eternal, and there are those who seek self. Those are the two groups that matter. You know what another word for this is? Idolatry. If you live as if life is all about you, you are not going to care about what God thinks is right or what God thinks is true. You will live for what you want and what you think is best. Paul is cranking up the heat here. There were plenty of Jews in his time period who kept all the rituals, who did all the right things, ate all the wrong foods, avoided, ate all the right foods, avoided all the wrong foods, did all the things they should do to keep them clean. And they were not righteous. They were Pharisees. Paul is saying, that outside ritual is not what separates one person from the next. Being a part of the Jewish culture or being a part of the Christian culture is not the key differentiating factor. Anyone here ever been to Pine Cove? Or a camp like Pine Cove? I've actually been to Pine Cove, but I've never been to a camp at Pine Cove. This is not about Pine Cove. Um, it's about camps. See, I grew up going to camps just like Pine Cove, except they were all on the West Coast. And from the time, I mean, I was a little kid up through college. I went to all kinds of camps like that. I have great, great memories. They're a very important part of my life with Christ growing up. Um, but I also have distinct memories of taking my Bible in the morning and sitting in a very public place so I could be seen having my devotions. I wanted to make sure that I was admired by people for look how godly he is. I didn't do that all the time. There are other times that that was not my motive at all. And the problem is not that I was reading my Bible. It's not even that I was reading my Bible in public. The problem was my motive. My motive was to be seen, to be admired. What my motive needed to be was to know God better and become like Christ. I needed a motive that was focused on the eternal. When my motive was admiration of people, it was a self-seeking motive, and it was idolatry. 
And that sort of thing doesn't just apply to reading your Bible in public. It applies to everything we just talked about, standing up here on stage, helping an old woman across the street. Idolatry does not turn a good deed into a righteous action. If your motive is glorification of yourself. Our, right, our unrighteousness will be dealt with by an impartial judge. And there is, is not a single special subculture anywhere that gives you a pass. And Paul wraps up this passage by showing the universal standard that God will apply when he judges. Verse 12 says that there is one universal standard that the impartial judge will always use when he, when he judges. And the issue is, have you sinned? Have you sinned? And this is going to sound a lot like last week because he's going to say, there are those who don't have the law, the Gentiles. And they are still judged. And there are those who have the law, Jews, and they are still judged. And then Paul gets to really what is the key verse in this entire passage, verse 13. The key point that he is making is that the Jewish people are not righteous just because they have the law and are hearers of the law. That is not what makes someone righteous. What makes someone righteous is that they do the law. There are all kinds of people in Paul's time, like we said, who would do all the things that were incredible about keeping the rituals. And Paul says, that is not what makes you righteous. There are all kinds of people. This is all over the place in the New Testament who said, I am Jewish, therefore I am righteous. Because we are the people of God's law. We are the people that God blessed with his law. And that's how they viewed it. And because we have God's law, God favors us. We are outside of his judgment. Paul says it's not just having the law and hearing the law that matters. It's not just showing up on Sunday that makes you righteous. It's not just reading the Bible. It's not doing great service projects. A person who only wants to build himself up can do every one of those things. What makes you righteous is what God does in you as you worship and read and pray and serve with a desire to know God, please him, and become like his son. Verses 14 and 15 take us back to last week very clearly. The Gentiles don't have God's law, but by nature, they know what the law requires. What God has done in creation is revealed enough about who he is and the nature of right and wrong that they have enough to go by to know at least the very basics of right and wrong. And not only is their nature, their conscience also bears witness and even their moral reasoning about what is right and wrong in themselves and others gives them no excuse. The standard of righteousness is universal. Jews have the law. Gentiles have what is revealed to them about God and right and wrong through nature. Paul's gospel that he refers to at the very end of the passage includes this. God is going to judge. He is going to judge by the Messiah, Jesus, and he is going to judge the secrets of men. And that judgment applies to absolutely everyone. And I want you to catch how important it is that he said the secrets of men. Because if what you think is that righteousness is really more about what you do on the outside, how well you conform to Christian culture, then you will never worry about motives, thoughts, attitudes. You will never worry about all those things that you can hide on the inside. But God does. He's not just judging the actions. He's not judging your cultural conformity. He is judging what's going on inside. And so here's Romans 2, verses 1 through 16. Paul says the issue is, do you follow the law? For Jews, that's the law that you were given by God. For Gentiles, that's the law is revealed through nature, 
conscience, your moral reasoning? If the answer is yes, then you're righteous. If the answer is no, then you're unrighteous. If the answer is yes, then you live for the eternal. If the answer is no, you live as self-seekers. If the answer is yes, what you have ahead of you is, and even presently is blessing, life with God. If the answer is no, what you have presently and in the future is God's wrath, life without God. That's the argument that he's making here. And now let's set this argument in context. What did he say last week? No one. This route is closed off. No one does this. Everyone is right here. Everyone has failed to keep the law. No matter what law it is, it's been re revealed to them. Every one of them has lived as self-seekers. Every one of them stands as unrighteous and deserving of the wrath of God, of life without God. Even the really good Jew who closely followed every ritual would be guilty of breaking the law at some point. And they were certainly guilty of being self-seeking at some point. And there are a bunch of people who come to church faithfully. They give to the church faithfully. They serve in the church faithfully. They read their Bibles and they do wonderful things. All with the goal of being a good Christian as defined by our community. And Paul says, unrighteous. That's where he leaves us in today's passage. But I want to keep pointing out that's not where he's going in Romans. This is part of an argument that he is building. And what Paul is going to say in Romans is that it's really not about following the law because you can't do it. The question is, are you in Christ? If you are in Christ... You have his righteousness, and his righteousness is perfect. You are credited with his righteousness. You are credited with everything that he did that was right, and the fact that he never did anything wrong. And so how you live is as a follower of Christ with God's people. If you are not in Christ, you're still living as a self-seeker, and you're still facing unrighteousness, the wrath of God. That's really where he's going. That's a summary of the entire book of Romans. The issue is, are you in Christ? And that's a question that we have to ask ourselves. What is it that you have pursued? Have you pursued Christian community? Has that been your goal? You want to fit in with this wonderful culture that you love. You like the music. You like being able to walk into a store and they're playing Christian music. You like the, the movies that they have, the TVs that they have. You like being around the people here. Is that what you are pursuing? Or are you pursuing Christ? My great-grandfather wrote a letter to my great-grandmother that I saw a few years ago. It was written early 1900s. My great-grandfather and great-grandmother were very godly people. He wrote this letter to her before they were married, and he was very, very concerned about her. Because he had heard that she had gone to a skating rink. Don't you know that good Christians don't go to the skating rink? We laugh at that. We know that that's just an extra biblical rule that his Christian culture came up with, probably very well-meaning, to define what it meant to be righteous. What would happen if my great-grandfather were to somehow show up here today in our church? We'd be fire-breathing heathens. 
well, at least we don't have roller skating rinks very much anymore. But that's what's happening with these Jews when they're returning to their churches in Rome. They saw that the churches didn't follow those rules and those practices that were so dear to them, that were important to them, that they used to define righteousness. And they're looking at these churches, they're looking at these Gentiles and say, how can you possibly think you're righteous? And we do the exact same thing today. I have lived in three different parts. I've lived in several different parts of the country. Three different parts of the country I can think of that in those parts of the country, it was a real Christian cannot own that type of car. And that brand of car changed, depending on where I lived. A real Christian, here's another one, only listens to Christian music and only will watch Christian TV and Christian movies. But here's what's fun. Depending on where I lived, what got counted as Christian movies, music, and TV changed. Don't throw anything at me. Depending on where I have lived, some people have said, how can you possibly be a Christian and a Democrat? And some places I've lived have said, how could you possibly be a Christian and a Republican? See, the people who said the first thing, there, there are things about the Democratic Party that really bother them, things that they hold to. Or don't hold to. That really bother them and they say that's not conforming to a biblical standard. And they're, they're right. The other place. Look at the Republican Party and said there are things that they don't hold to. That the Bible is very clear about. The Bible is very, very clear about. But that's nowhere on their agenda. How can you call yourself a good Christian? And hold to that party. And they're right. The Bible is very clear about those things. And at least at that time period. That party. It was no, nowhere on their radar. I would suggest. That not only are they both right. But they're both wrong. They both observe things correctly. That those parties were missing. Or they were wrong is when they started the sentence with, how could a good Christian? Because I don't find Democrats and Republicans anywhere in Scripture. I find righteousness and unrighteousness. And the only person who's ever lived that out perfectly was not a politician. It was my Savior. But I have been in so many churches that will take things as silly as the brand of a car, what's playing on your radio, something less silly as what candidate you voted for, and say, that's the measure of righteousness. And I wonder if we don't do the same thing. See, here's the challenge of East Texas. East Texas is filled with people who have fallen in love with Christian culture and not with Christ, and they do not know the difference. And my question for you is, is that you? They are just like Paul's imaginary debater. They do lots of great things in the church. They serve in the community. They even witness door to door. They vote the right way. They watch the right media. They avoid all of the bad things. But in their hearts, they are self-seeking and they have no intention of changing that. In their minds, they are thinking, why change? All God cares about is being in the right group and I fit. They think that being church busy means that they are God approved. That's exactly what Paul is writing against here. 
he's saying to these Jewish Christians, but loud enough that the Gentiles hear, cultural religion does not save from God's impartial judgment. That judgment is coming. And just the fact that you're a part of the group is not the issue. The issue is what are you doing with your heart? The issue is that we are called to love and pursue Christ, not Christian culture. And here's the difference. If you are pursuing Christian culture, that means doing what they do just to fit in. If you're pursuing Christ, that means doing what he does so that you can be like him. If you're pursuing Christian culture, it means valuing what they value so you will fit in. If you're pursuing Christ, it means valuing what he values so that you will be like him. How do we respond? Again, I'm encouraging you to rewrite Romans, um, but that should say, it doesn't look like, that's interesting. For some reason, I've got last week's up there. Um, so I'll just tell you what's actually on your sheet. Rewrite Romans 2, 1 through 16 in your own words. Relationally, seek forgiveness where you have been judgmental. Because we all have. We all have been guilty of being Paul's imaginary debate partner. Or we have looked at someone else and said, look at you, you are condemned when we ourselves have been guilty. Identify two areas in your life where you've been spiritually apathetic, where you're living as if God doesn't care about this. But you know he does. And then go to him in prayer about that. Seek his strength to pursue him where you've been spiritually apathetic. If you're here and you have only known Christian culture and you have never known Christ, can I invite you to meet him? Because he's so much better than the culture. If you are here and you are living to fit in Christian culture and not living to be like Christ, then I want you to invite you to change your goal. And if you are someone who is a mature Christian and you know what it's like to live to fit into Christian culture as opposed to living to be with Christ, look around you. Be aware that you're surrounded by people who struggle with that. And will you speak words of encouragement and support and guidance into their lives? I'm going to invite the prayer team to come forward. And as they come forward, it doesn't matter which one of those groups you're in. I want to encourage you to come and, and talk with someone from the prayer team. Share what your struggle is. Share what you desire. And let us pray with you and encourage you. And if today's topic isn't what's on your radar, if you're struggling with, with a relationship or, or finances or job or, or just life in general, let us stand with you and pray. I would like us to stand together and pray just as a sign of unity with one another before God. Heavenly Father, we come before you in confession. We come before you recognizing that we are lovers of self more than lovers of Jesus. We want to be like one another more than we want to be like Jesus. This is part of how sin has tainted us, and we recognize that we struggle. But Lord, we are so grateful that you are kind, you are forbearing, and you are patient in the face of our sin that we might repent. We are so grateful that you make us righteous in Christ with his righteousness. But Lord, what we need today and this week is your help to pursue Christ more than we pursue Christian culture. Lord, change the direction of our hearts that we may pursue true righteousness and not the culturally defined righteousness. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Here's what we've said about who God is. 
The passage is very clear. God is kind, he is forbearing, he is patient. So what do we do with that? The passage again was clear. God is that way towards us. That we would stop substituting Christian culture for pursuing Christ. And that we would deal with our mess. That is your challenge as you leave. You are dismissed.